evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Addie Licari, a family physician with St. Luke's Mount Royal Medical Clinic, and I will be your host for tonight's program on men's health and kidney stones. Please let us know of any questions about general male health concerns or specific things like incontinence or prostate and kidney issues or bladder disease. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, a urologist with St. Luke's Urology Associates, Dr. Travis Moncrief, a urologist with Essentia Health, and Dr. Chris Thiessen, a family medicine physician at the Gateway Family Health Clinic in Moose Lake. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Jacob Bentley of Austin, Minnesota, Spencer Goebel of Aiken, Minnesota, and Christopher Little of International Falls. The success of this program depends on you, the viewer, so please call in those questions and we'll do our best to address them. The telephone numbers for your questions can be found at the bottom of your screen. And now on to tonight's program. Uh, I'd like to start off um, by just asking each of our guests here to tell us a little bit more about your practice and yourself, so I'll have Elizabeth start. Thank you, Addie. Um, my name is Elizabeth Johnson. I'm a urologist at St. Luke's. I have been in practice there for about four years, and I do general urology, which means that I take care of men, women, and some children with urologic issues. I'm Travis Moncrief. I'm a urologist at Essentia Health. I've been there about two years. Um, I also am a urologist who uh, has a fairly broad practice. My interests include um, urologic oncology, so cancers of the, of the uh, urinary tract, uh, treatment of stone diseases, and then issues with incontinence um, are things I specialize in. And I'm Christopher Thiessen. I've been working in Moose Lake for 17 years, and I am a family physician, and I like to specialize in everything. So I'm a generalist that uh, delivers babies, uh, takes care of kids to adults. Thank you very much. Um, we'll kind of start off with a hot topic here. Um, Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about PSA and general screening for prostate cancer and how you sure. approach that with your male patients? Of course. So screening is always a decision that uh, really varies depending on people's situation. And so we want to talk to people about whether it makes sense. If you're looking at general rules, it seems to make the most sense to do PSAs between ages uh, about 55 and 70. But you also want to think of the health of the person where if they're expected to live longer, they might be more likely to do screening. And if they're in pretty frail health, it might not make a lot of sense. I'd also like to give you a, uh, 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 sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Any other input from the urology sort of profession on this screening topic? So I think the urologist usually comes into play after the frontline mm -hmm. screening has already occurred. So we're most typically seeing men who have an elevation or abnormality in their PSA. And oftentimes they've had multiple PSAs before they come and see us. When they come to us, generally it's my practice to review with the patient, how do we get here, why are we here, is it appropriate that we're here, and should we continue screening and, and move down this path of investigating the elevation in the PSA. So that's really first line from my perspective when I see someone with a concern. I would, I would echo that same point. Usually a patient would come to me, have an elevated PSA, and we'd have a discussion about what that means, that it's a protein that's produced by the prostate but can also be produced by cancer. I was just going and to so ask that. It doesn't <laughs> necessarily mean that you have prostate cancer, but it, it, it needs to be investigated further. And based on the patient's particular situation, we may investigate that in a number of, a number of ways. One is, is oftentimes a biopsy. But it's also, I think, important, I always want to try to set expectations because they may have had a father who had prostate cancer. And it was probably treated very differently. Historically, prostate cancer has just been looked at as you either have cancer or you don't, and you'd proceed to treatment kind of regardless of what kind of cancer it was. Nowadays, I think we've developed a greater sophistication in how we approach prostate cancer. So just because you may come back with a biopsy and you're diagnosed with cancer, it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna recommend treatment. We may end up saying we just need to keep an eye on this. We may need some further tests. Okay. And so I, I think it's important to set that groundwork first so the patient kind of knows what possibilities lie ahead. Good thoughts. Um, we have our first question of the day. So Chris, I'm gonna give this one to you um, to start off with. Others chime in. Um, the question is uh, from Carlton, 
and it is, do most men experience erectile dysfunction, and what are some common causes? Um, I would say that we have, if you define erectile dysfunction as having a problem at some point in your life, I think the numbers are fairly high. If you're talking about something where you feel that it is happening more frequently and uh, that it's affecting your love life, then we have a lower number of people, but of course we have several options to try and help. And one of the first things that we try and do is figure out uh, if the blood vessel function for the penis is working well and uh, try and use medications that can help that. You also want to try and make sure if somebody's testosterone levels are okay and whether that might be affecting it. Travis, what other things affect um, erectile dysfunction outside of <coughs> sort of the blood vessel issues? So the, the most common, the first and most common is the blood vessel issue and then it's things that kind of contribute to narrowing of those blood vessels. Diabetes is a big risk factor. High blood pressure is a big uh, risk factor um, for ability to attain erections. There also is a psychological factor to erections, which can, that's, it's usually a small minority of cases, but it is a possibility that situationally patients have difficulty attaining erections and, and, and that needs to be looked at as well. So. I would add smoking as another cause of okay. problems Very with good. the blood vessels that can lead to problems with erections. Mm -hmm. Um, Elizabeth, are there common causes of bladder infections and is there a general medication for that? Um, this is Kim and Cloquet asking. Okay, so bladder infections are, it's a very um, diverse problem. There are, I think, a few different ways to divide up infections of the urinary tract. People who have a, specifically women who have a particular you know, one episode bladder infection, that's very common for a woman to have an infection at some point in her life. When we start to see problems on a recurrent basis, so having multiple culture proven infections every year, that's a little bit of a different problem. I should right now say when a male patient comes in with a bladder infection at any point, that's completely different and warrants further attention basically immediately. So with regard to the question, is there a particular medication or one thing that we do to help women get fewer infections? No, <laughs> there's, <laughs> not, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's, um, as I mentioned before, a very common problem for someone to have one or two or a sporadic urinary tract infection. When someone comes in with concerning findings of recurrent infections of the same organism or other associated symptoms with their bladder or elsewhere in their body, we we will do a more thorough investigation. We try to avoid recurrent courses of antibiotics that's harmful to people's health. We try to avoid antibiotics when they don't have proof of an infection on a culture. So I would recommend that anyone who's having issues with infections or anyone on the kind of front lines, primary care seeing women or men with, with infections to be cognizant of the fact that not all infections are created equal, that anyone with a urinary complaint should be tested for an infection, but not just a quick urine check, an actual culture, and that will help us down the road if this is becoming a recurrent problem. Okay. And Travis, why do men and women get bladder infections at a different rate, or why are women more susceptible? So it's really based on the anatomy. In, in females, the urethra is very short, and so it's a much shorter distance, essentially, for bacteria to ascend into the bladder and to cause an infection. In males, the urethra is much longer, and it's, so in males, it's, it's much less common to get urinary tract infections, and there's usually an underlying a reason why. I have a question from Mark from Duluth. Um, he's age 72 and he says that his general physician stopped doing a digital rectal exam on him at this age and he wants to know why. So I'm wondering if you can address that. So, yeah, so I think that, you know, the digital rectal exam in addition to the PSA is a yearly screening tool for prostate cancer. Um, typically, if there is not a specific reason to do the DRE outside of that, between those age ranges of 55 and 69 is when you should be getting a yearly digital rectal exam. Beyond that, it would be really situational if, if a patient was having other issues, blood in the urine, difficulty voiding, things like that, you may get a rectal exam, but you don't need a screening yearly exam. Okay. 
Um, Elizabeth, I'll have you address sort of these two questions. I have sure. Ren from Duluth um, and then an anonymous caller. Um, the questions are regarding a sudden urge to urinate or neurogenic bladder and so what stimulates sort of the bladder to want to urinate and, and when can that go wrong? So if I'm interpreting the question appropriately, someone is talking about an urge to urinate when they think they otherwise shouldn't have to and that can be caused by a variety of conditions. Um, most commonly it's important to figure out has the person actually recently voided? What are their voiding habits during the day? What kind of fluids are they drinking? Do they have history of infections or other anatomic issues with their urinary tract? And then going through um, basically uh, to tie this into the neurogenic bladder piece of it um, to try to answer two questions at once. When taking a history in someone who is having issues with urinary urgency, trying to sort out if there's some bigger picture issue. Do they have an issue with their brain or their spinal cord that could be sending the wrong messages to their bladder or having it um, become more difficult for their brain to interpret the signals coming from their bladder. So these are, these are both really broad topics, specifically urinary urgency, and um, we could certainly dedicate an entire half hour or hour long show just to that, that symptom. Okay. Chris, do you want to um, tell me a little bit about how you and your colleagues in primary care sort of approach kidney stones and then sort of we'll pass it off to the urologist as far as further work up? Sure. Um, the first thing is to try and make sure that somebody has them because when somebody comes in with pain in their flank, it may be from a kidney stone or from some other cause. And so oftentimes something to do with an x-ray or CT would be the way to try and figure that out. Also looking at blood in their urine and whether they have a history of stones. Um, we want to try and help that stone and you can use medication that makes it a little bit more likely to pass along with cutting down on pain. We want to try and find out if that stone is likely to pass because sometimes even if you've had stones that passed before, you may have uh, one that's a lot bigger and unlikely to pass. Um, and then we want to think about prevention. So if you can catch that stone in a strainer and figure out what it's made of, sometimes we can help you not get one again. And when you see someone in the office, Travis, who's had a history of kidney stones, how do you, how, what approach do you take to talking with them about prevention or? or? So prevention is an important topic to talk about, and typically it starts with the composition of the stone. So there are not all stones are created equal. There's different compositions, and those are caused by different, uh, can be caused by different underlying uh, conditions. And so my treatment plan would be based on that. And oftentimes, if a patient is coming back frequently with urinary tract uh, with uh, kidney stones, we'll end up getting a 24-hour urine analysis, which will give us essentially the the mineral content of their urine um, and uh, electrolyte content and that can help us to to tailor uh, a strategy for preventing stones in the future for them. Along that line Elizabeth, how do we treat kidney stones when they don't want to pass? So it depends on the size and the location of the stone. It also depends on the patient and what they are well suited to in terms of their um, anesthetic risk and, and whether they can tolerate surgery. So the vast majority of stones now are, when they're symptomatic, are located in the ureter. And given advances in technology and our current equipment that we have, ureteroscopy is the most common type of stone treatment that's performed. So essentially a camera exam of the exactly. ureter, which is the tube from the kidney to the bladder. Exactly. Yeah. The stones can then be broken up and the pieces extracted. If someone has a much larger stone or stones that are in the kidney and enlarging, not necessarily causing symptoms, but are not going to pass. Uh, we have techniques for entering the kidney through the back and, and breaking up the stone that way. There are pros and cons to each of these approaches, and in any one scenario, that's a discussion that, that we have with the patient to determine what would be the best suited procedure. Mm -hmm. Kind of along that line, we have a, a patient named Art who is calling in. Um, he states he had stents placed in his ureters um, and had medications. Uh, and sort of describe why we would do that and what that sort of process looks like for treating a kidney stone. For treating? Yeah. So anyone who's un going to undergo ureteroscopy, which is going up with the camera to break up the stone and then pull out the pieces, 
uh, their ureter may be too narrow at first and we have to leave a stent which allows passive dilation of that ureter and then allows you to get up with your instruments to take out the stone. Um, the other reason you have a stent is after the stone is treated you get swelling in the in the ureter and if you didn't leave a stent you'd end up having very severe pain and would be back in the ER if you didn't have that stent placed. So that's the reason for the stent is to relieve any obstruction. Um, unfortunately stents come with issues as well and it's probably the uh, the part for patients that bothers them the most is the stent related symptoms. Because you have a foreign body both sitting in the bladder, usually it's at the bladder neck, which is the most sensitive area of the bladder and sitting up in the kidney, um, it's keeping the, the ureter open but at the same time it will cause frequency and urgency to urinate and oftentimes a good deal of discomfort. And So there's medications out there that we can, that we can give to help with that. Um, ultimately removing the stent, which, which is what you need to do. Um, usually about a week after surgery, it w will relieve all the symptoms. And sort of the second part to that question, Chris, I'll ask you is, mm -hmm. um, do kidney stones cause kidney damage? Can they lead to kidney disease? The kidney stones can be a manifestation of some kidney diseases, and having kidney stones uh, partially block the urine or completely block the urine can really cause kidney damage. Also, if they get infected and make you more prone to kidney infections, that can cause damage. I think those would be the main ways that they harm kidneys. Is that right? I would agree. Uh, okay. Recurrent episodes of kidney blockage related to stones that have formed multiple times in someone who, if they were to have other health issues such as high blood pressure or diabetes, their kidneys can be a bit fragile to start with. So blocking them over and over with stones is certainly concerning. Travis, can you tell me exactly what are kidney stones made of? Some examples of? So the most common type of kidney stone is a calcium oxalate stone. So it's calcium based. Oxalate is something that you consume in your diet that you excrete in the urine, but you also pass in the stools as well. Usually isn't an issue. But in certain patients, usually they're genetically predisposed to forming stones, and that calcium and oxalate molecule combine, and they crystallize in the urine and form stones. Um, there's a number of other different types. Calcium-based stones of one sort or another are the most common. Okay, and what type of diet, Elizabeth, should patients who have kidney stones follow? So getting back to stone composition being an important piece of this, 24-hour urine collection is also a very important piece. If you're going to give someone very specific advice, it's important that we have that information at our disposal. In general, for any patient who's had a kidney stone, if they say we don't know what it's made out of and they've never had a 24-hour urine collection, the number one recommendation is to drink more water. It's water, water, and water are the top three things we tell people. And then cutting down on salt, that is a big factor. And cutting down on animal proteins is very important. All, when it comes to stone risk, all meat and fish is essentially equivalent in terms of increasing stone risk. So cutting down on meat is important. Increasing fruits and vegetables in the diet can be very helpful as a source of citrate, which helps to decrease stone formation. Um, and it's also an important point, people will often hear stones are made of calcium, maybe I should cut down on calcium. And that's exactly the opposite thing um, of what they should be doing, which is maintaining a normal level of calcium intake in their diet. Um, we have uh, Rose from Cloquet who is asking, uh, she drinks lots of water, but sometimes her urine is yellow or it's bright orange despite drinking lots of water. Um, Chris, do you have any input as to why the urine may be so different in well, color? Well, for someone with a urine color issue like that, she probably should at some point just check that orangish urine to see if there's blood in it. But otherwise, uh, lots of things that you eat will have uh, colors that pass through, including vitamins and supplements. Um, and uh, you may be drinking fairly regularly, but sometimes you might cut back a little bit and have more yellow urine just because of that? A uh, question for you, Travis. I have Christina in Duluth who, who wants a little bit of discussion regarding why women become incontinent and probably best, how do, you, how do we treat that sort of in medicine? So, so I would divide incontinence into three major reasons. Um, probably the two most common is a stress variety or an urge variety incontinent in females. Um, Urge variety is you essentially have an overactive bladder that is contracting when you don't want it to. 
and that contraction um, will lead to leakage of some urine. The other issue is your external sphincter is a way that you stop yourself from leaking urine and that can, you can develop laxity in the pelvic floor, which is wh what the uh, external urinary sphincter is made of. And uh, that laxity makes it so when you cough or sneeze or do something strenuous, you end up leaking a small amount of urine. Do we have treatments for women who have these issues? We sure do. Okay. <laughs> Depending on the type of incontinence that somebody has, um, there are a variety of things we can offer. And I think the important things to remember are that stre stress and urge incontinence are very common amongst women. And starting the conversation with your doctor is the way to get directed toward an appropriate treatment. We have medications that we will use frequently. We often refer women to see pelvic floor trained physical therapists, which are very helpful. And then we have a variety of surgical procedures um, that can help with both stress and urge incontinence. And from your perspective, uh, which treatments seem most satisfactory to women? Because we do have a lot of them that just will try a medicine, for example, and they're just not happy. Yeah. And what I'd really like to do is hopefully find something that works well for people. We all would like to find something <laughs> that works well for people. It's, it's difficult to answer that question because every case really is truly different. Um, some, some women will find it more satisfactory to put the time and effort into physical therapy and mm -hmm. avoid surgery. And other women love the idea of having a procedure to fix their incontinence and just be done with it. And they're willing to take on the risks that go along with it. Mm -hmm. As far as medications, it's often trial and error, and a medication that works well for somebody will cause severe side effects and not help in another patient. So I think setting expectations up front that we don't have a quick fix for most people and that it takes a little bit of trial and error, um, that's an important point in management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And although, so the medications oftentimes aren't as effective as some of the more invasive means, we always want to start with the least invasive means, which is typically very conservative in, in looking at what they're eating and drinking to, to try to control their incontinence and then moving to medications and letting the patient know that there's other options down the line. And like Dr. Johnson said, you're, you're moving down a pathway. And so they, mm -hmm. you know, one thing doesn't work, it doesn't mean that we're not going to find something that works. It's just going to take some time. So Travis, along that lines, do men become incontinent? And what are sort of the different causes in men that make them incontinent? Men do become incontinent. I would say one of the most common reasons that I see um, incontinence in men um, of a stress variety, stress incontinence is after a surgery to remove the prostate. Um, in those situations, they, they can develop incontinence where when they cough or sneeze, they end up leaking urine. And, and there are options out there, um, surgical options to fix that. You can. Uh, implant an artificial urinary sphincter that replaces the, the normal sphincter they had. Okay. Any other input? Um, I think it's also an important point. Men can have urge-related incontinence and overactive bladder, and oftentimes these can signal some other, or can be a sign of some other problem that they have going on. Men will often leak urine as a result of overflow incontinence when they are retaining so much urine because of an enlarged or obstructing prostate that they will start noticing urine leakage, most commonly at night. So it's important to talk to your doctor and get these things checked out. And Chris, along that lines, are, what are the symptoms of your prostate enlarging? Or what, what can be sort of the first signs or symptoms of a prostate? I would say that as people get, as men get older, then, uh, um, oftentimes there's some slowness in urinating. It might be just a little bit slower to start and you might get up at night once or twice. If those things change quickly, then that's something that should be checked out for sure. Um, if you feel that that's a very gradual process um, and you feel that you empty your bladder entirely, then that's not something where you need to run into your doctor and get it checked out right away. Great. Well, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, Dr. Travis Moncrief, and Dr. Chris Thiessen, and our medical student phone volunteers, Jacob Bentley, Spencer Goebel, and Christopher Little. 
Please join Dr. Ray Christensen in two weeks for a program on upper extremity neck and back problems, when his panelists will be Dr. Robert Benjarowicz, Dr. Samuel Harms, and Dr. Brad Kuzel. Thank you for watching, and good night.